Hello friends, thank you for watching this video. I am Muhammad and today we're going to be starting a journey studying for the AWS Solution Architect certification. Part of this journey, we're going to be actually going through every single module of the certification that is required for us to actually study for the exam. We're going to be actually going through every single item in the, inside that module and explaining it. So it's like going to be a long journey and we're going to be taking it bit by bit, specifically for people who don't really know anything about AWS. And we're going to be, I'm going to try my best in order for me to break down the complex topics and make them easy for, uh, to understand and to comprehend. Uh, this is certification. I'm hopefully able to take it, I think, in May or September. So uh, I'm hoping uh, from now to then I will be able to finish all of the modules and actually be uh, ready for the exam. So if you have any questions, any comments, any feedback, please put them in the comments down below. So let's get started. So we're going to start by going through the fundamentals. Basically, all of the information that we need to know in order for us to get started by studying for our certification. So first things first is going to be the agenda. So what are we going to be covering today? We're going to be discussing what is the cloud, some of the benefits of the cloud, AWS cloud in specific. Then we're going to be going through AWS global infrastructure. Then who owns what? Basically the responsibilities that we need to take a look at and basically the main services that we need in order for us to get certified. So what is the cloud? In essence, the cloud refers to is like uh, servers are basically are scattered uh, all around the world. And these servers basically belong to a certain company. It could be Amazon, it could be Azure, it could be Google. And those servers basically have some kind of software basically installed on them. And this software is basically responsible to run the uh, application that we put there, the database, the different uh, blockchain, for example, AI. All of these are configured by them. The, by the cloud provider. So all we need to know is uh, if we're going to think of a cloud is basically servers of which is uh, scattered around the world and they have certain software uh, installed on them which allow us to run our application or different services that those cloud providers give us in order for us to actually utilize the cloud. So what are the main benefits of the cloud? First of all, it's cost saving. So instead of us buying all of the servers manually, but hosting them ourselves, we can utilize cloud service provider. Basically, there's a lot of different pricing tiers. Uh, we can only pay for what we need. And there's even like a functionality like serverless when we only pay per execution time, which is really good. Another thing is security. Other than handling our own application security, the security of the machines that they are being run on is very high because basically they are uh, scattered all, all around the world. That's the first thing. And they have a high uh, physical security in order for them to basically anyone to access those servers. And second, the way that the cloud is set up, it's very, very secure. So it's give us a lot of peace of mind that our code or basically our application is going to be run securely. Again, that doesn't mean that we don't really need to do our part when it comes to securing our software or our application. But knowing that there is a lot of a layer of security available from the cloud provider, that's really good. Third is uh, saving time. So again, it all comes down of how we can actually uh, benefit to the maximum. And instead of us actually having to set up the servers, configuration, upgrading them, everything can be done from the cloud and the cloud provider can handle, handle all of that for us. Uh, product innovation. The cloud is at the upfront of uh, all of the innovation that's coming. It contains blockchain, it contains quantum computing, even satellites, it contains um, a lot of the different uh, uh, new and latest created technology that are available and we can actually utilize, utilize them by a click of a button. So from there we can see like one of the main benefits that we can actually have when it comes to utilizing cloud. Reliability. We're going to see within the first couple of slides how the cloud actually uh, works. But reliability means in case that like, we host our, uh, our application in one certain data center, in case there's something happen with the data center, like the uh, powers goes off or the uh, connection drops off, it's automatically backed up to a different data center. Uh, and basically, the application will continue running from there without us even realizing that that happened. And that's something that's really, really important. Flexibility, again, it goes also again to the payments. So for example, we can only pay for what we need as well as the services that we set up. You can only set up the service that we need. We don't really need to keep an entire infrastructure up and running if we're only hosting, for example, a simple web application. And lastly, performance enhancer. So for example, let's say locally from our side, if we're having our own server and our application is running on our own server and all of a sudden, for example, uh, our server is can only run, for example, up to like 10,000 uh, users. What happens if our application gets 50,000 users? So if we're going to come from our side, what we need to do is we need to install a new server, configure a load balancer, configure our application, 
and then basically do all of the infrastructure to communicate to make all of these servers communicate and then our application will be able to scale up on the other hand on the cloud this can be done out of the box which by setting some certain uh, rules when it comes to the application itself the application can actually scale up and scale down based on what we need and based on even the traffic so we can set up a rule for example if our cpu is more than 50 percent for like more than two minutes it will automatically initiate a new instance or for example if our memory is uh, up to 80 percent for more than a minute it automatically scale up a new instance of, uh, of our machines so all of these tools we can actually set it up but now we can see how the performance of our application is directly impacted by the cloud so it will automatically scale up and down based on our needs So in essence, AWS, which stands for Amazon Web Services, provides a cloud for us. And it's basically at a platform that contains more than 200 products. We're gonna go through them a bit. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot, of, uh, a lot for us to learn uh, out of the back of our hearts, but in essence, it contains a lot of different services that it allows us to actually utilize on a pay-as-you-go uh, basis where we can actually only pay for the service that we need. And if you wanna experiment, we also have ability to experiment with some of the services. Again, AWS will also contain some free services that we can utilize for a lifetime. So we said the cloud is formed of uh, computers scattered all around the world, but how are these computers all grouped together? So in essence, those computers are grouped within data centers. So let's say we have groups of computer in the US, groups of computer in the UK, groups of computer in France, and so on and so forth. So the way these computers are stacked together or uh, put together within data centers. So data centers in essence, they are basically buildings which contains hundreds or thousands of servers running together. And these uh, servers basically have their own uh, power supply, have their own internet connectivity, have their own networking, have their own physical security. So for example, let's say uh, this uh, data center, for example, uh, the, the, the location where it is, there's some kind of power failure. It has its own sustainability for the power. So it will not go down even if the power around it goes down. So that's a really good thing. As well, all of these data centers will run some kind of software where it will actually, it, it allows it to communicate with a different data center which exist are all around the world and basically it communicates all within the AWS network and that way we can access multiple data centers when it comes to actually building our applications and data centers as well they are uh, organized and sorted in many different ways so one of them is going to be regions and they're going to be also uh, through uh, availability zones we're going to be discussing this in the next couple of slides but for now if you want to understand data centers basically they are buildings which contains hundreds of thousands of computers all connected to the same network and they basically all connect with the AWS network and those data centers have their own uh, power supply, uh, connectivity and networking and physical security so it makes it its own independent basically entity. So now that we understand what is a data center, how they are organized. In essence, AWS uh, organized data centers by region. So for example, we can think uh, of a region as like uh, places around the world where we can have multiple data centers available. And basically every region will contain two or more availability zone. And we're gonna be discussing availability zone in different, uh, in the next slide. But uh, if we wanna understand region, region in essence, it means that we have an actual physical location. We can say the UK, we can say the US, we can say, for example, Singapore, we can say uh, Bahrain, and from there, for example, we know in every single physical location, we're going to have certain data centers and these data centers inside these locations are available into the availability zone. So we can see here from the picture, let me move myself a bit down. Let me move myself a bit. We can see here that we have our region and this region, it could be, for example, in the UK and we can see here uh, inside the UK or Ireland, for example, we can see that we have uh, the first availability zone, the second availability zone and third availability zone. And this is all within the same uh, physical uh, location or a single uh, yeah, physical location or single country where actually it works. In. So that's a, a region. So now let's understand what is an availability zone. 
in essence an availability zone is basically two or more data centers available together so what does that mean so for example let's as we said for example we have uh, every single data center has its own power supply has its own uh, physical security connectivity and networking so in order for those availability zone let's say if one of them uh, if one of these data centers goes down another one has to be pick up the work because they are interconnected together so how do we do that it's through availability zone so availability zone means one data center is connected to another data center and basically uh, all of those information are interlinked between these two data center for example there's like some kind of kind of replication and these usually are not 100 are, are less than 100 kilometers apart so in case something happens in that data center the other one it could be safer as well these uh, availability zone uh, protect uh, against data failure against uh, anything that happened to that main data center the other one will be able to pick up the work and again uh, those availability zone are as well a sets of data centers so we can think about and let's say we have a region which we can say it's the uk uh, and for example with the uk south uh, we can say that we have uh, two availability zone and uh, each availability zone will contain four data centers and basically they are duplicates of each other and that way we, uh, we can make sure that all of our information within that availability zone is backed up and safe so uh, aws will take care of all of that we don't really have to really uh, worry about it in essence all we need to understand is uh, how they are actually scattered so we said we have uh, the region which is going to be the main point which is the actual physical location and within that region we're going to have multiple data centers in different availability zone in order for us to have a backup in case something happened to the main uh, data center so once we have understood uh, understood availability zone the next item is edge location so in essence uh, edge location is a very simple uh, explanation we're going to go through it right now but in, it's utilized in order for us to actually have caching for our services we're not going to go into details right now we're going to be covering growth caching in, in future videos but for now we can think about it or we can understand or actually just know the word cloud front which is a service that aws provide in order for us to cache our information and in essence uh, all of the aws edge location will provide this caching functionality so we can see here that we have this region and we have three different availability zone and we can see that we have one two three four five six uh, edge location and these edge location basically help us cache our information and it's a rule of thumb there is always more uh, edge locations and there is availability centers availability zones sorry so it's something really we need to be wary about edge locations are always more than um, the uh, availability zones and basically in, in essence uh, edge locations allow us to uh, cache our information so who owns what something really important when it comes to having our certification in aws or to understand what is our role and what is aws's role so everything that we cannot actually physically do is aws's role so every time we get a question about understanding uh, is this something that we need to do or basically aws we need to uh, we need to ask ourselves is this something that we can actually do ourselves if it's something that we need to do ourselves it's mostly it's something that we actually are responsible for if it's not something that we can do ourselves it's most probably aws uh, 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 role so for example physical location of the data centers the security guard the cameras so on so forth uh, who's who's actually uh, uh, setting up the um, uh, camera security cameras who's actually uh, setting up the I don't know the checkpoints for the employee to enter that's something that we cannot control AWS will have to do that who's responsible to change a server if it failed who's responsible to make sure the electricity is always go is going who's responsible for the cooling uh, who's responsible for the networking and the internet connection it's not something that we can control all of these are basically AWS responsibility on the other hand when we deploy our application to the AWS, uh, the thing that we need to think of is what is our responsibility? So if we're hosting customers' data, it's our responsibility to protect this data. If we are building our application or hosting an application, we need to actually, we are responsible for the configuration of that application. We are responsible to granting access and not granting access to that application. If, for example, we're having IAM users or for different teams, we are responsible for, for configuring the IAM users. If you don't know what an IAM user is, now we're going to be covering it down in a later video. For example, if we have a lot of traffic, who are responsible to setting up the load balance? And, and so on and so forth so here we can see that everything that belongs to us or the stuff that we can actually do is we own it 
something that's out of our hand belongs to AWS. There is one item which is really important that actually we share the responsibility between us and AWS, which is encryption. So for example, let's say we want to encrypt certain file. Once we actually enable that encryption functionality from the AWS portal, AWS will have to actually do that uh, encryption on the server. And that's, uh, that's a shared responsibility that we need to do between us and AWS. So this is, I think, the one of the main things that is, uh, is shared between the two endpoint, between the two uh, groups, which is us and AWS. And it takes uh, it takes two, uh, the two of us in order for us to actually make it work. So we need to save the encryption or actually let, let them know that we want encryption and AWS will actually need to do those encryption. Other than that, we need to ask ourselves uh, ourself the question, are we able to do this without AWS? If we are able to do this, it's most probably our responsibility. If it's, we're not able to do it, it's most probably AWS responsibility. And finally, for today, we're going to be discussing what is the services that we actually need in order for us to actually get our certification. So basically, those services that we we'll need to know is fall under four different categories. The first one is compute. The second one is storage. The third one is database. And last one is networking. So compute is basically when us hosting an application on the cloud, like some kind of a server, some kind of a computer. And that server or computer will actually give us the ability to actually run our application. And AWS, uh, we have provided us with multiple different ways of compute. But the main three that we need to be worried about or actually learn about is EC2. Lambda and Elastic Beamstock. We're going to be discussing these in much more details, but for now, it's just a quick overview, overview about them. The second thing is storage. So basically, it's going to be either storing our files, storing, for example, different uh, resources for our website, for example, different documents. So again, uh, storage allows us to actually host us and host those files somewhere on the cloud. And the different uh, storage that we need to take a look at are basically S3, which is simple storage service. Uh, elastic uh, beam stall. Uh, I think it's elastic file system. I can't really remember it. And EF, uh, EF, uh, FSX and storage gateway. Don't worry about them. Uh, we're just for here. We're just listing them, but we're going to be covering them in much more detail as we go. As for databases, we're basically all of our uh, our application data is, is stored in. Uh, we're going to be talking about RDS, which is our relation da relation database. Uh, DynamoDB, which in essence is our non-SQL database, and Redshift. And lastly, when it comes to networking, we need to understand what is networking, how do they work. So the first one is VPC, which is virtual private cloud, which in essence means uh, it's going to be our, our, our own small virtual data center on the cloud when we want to host any of our applications. A direct connect, it allows us to actually connect our uh, uh, our uh, off, uh, our off the cloud data center with the cloud. So if we have like a data center inside our uh, company or our, our own home, for example, and we want to connect it to the cloud, uh, Open Direct Connect will allow us to do that. Route 53, it's like a DNS, um, API Gateway, and the Global Accelerator, we're going to also discuss in much more details. So in essence, these are the services that we'll need to know about in order for us to pass our certification. But for now, we're just, we're just mentioning them as they are in order for us to actually first know about them and actually to uh, understand how do, where do they fit inside the four different categories. So uh, I hope this video was helpful. Uh, again, this is going to be like a, a weekly or bi-weekly videos where we're actually covering different topics within AWS in order for us to get our uh, AWS certification. And uh, hopefully uh, this video, you will find them helpful. Please like, share and subscribe if you actually uh, if you like this video and have a great day.